There we go. All right, now I'm going to get it started. Welcome, everybody, to IPHA's third Thursday Lunch and Learn web series organized by the IPHA Education Committee. I'd like to dedicate this time every month to sharing our successes and even some of the detours it may have taken to get to those successes, because those can help us too. The point is to connect, learn, and strengthen our voice for public health in Iowa, which, of course, is part of the mission of IPHA. If you're a member of IPHA, we thank you for that. If you're not yet a member, we invite you to join us and help carry out that mission. You can do that on our website at iowapha.org. Today, we're joined by Abigail Shehak and Ann Abbott, about, um, who will speak with us about the IPHA social community, social media community of practice. There we go, got it out. Uh, but before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Your microphone should be muted. Um, the camera's off during the presentation. Just help us keep enough bandwidth, make sure everyone can see. We have quite a few here today. Um, you can put your questions in the chat for Q&A features. Um, and there should be time towards the end where we can unmute, turn cameras on, um, and ask some, some questions if you'd like. Uh, the session is now being recorded. Um, it will be posted to IPHA's YouTube channel afterwards where you can find uh, past lunch and learns and any other webinars that you may have missed. Uh, but now with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Abigail and Ann to introduce themselves and get us started. Great. Well, thank you, Brett and Sharon and the rest of the IPHA crew for having us. Um, and welcome, everybody. Um, we have a bigger crew than I thought we might have on St. Patty's Day and spring break week for many of us. Um, so if folks could start off by just putting your name and kind of what organization you represent in the chat. Um, we are going to have some discussion questions if we go along as we go along. And I feel like for this big of a group, Abigail and I had talked about maybe starting with uh, chat stuff and then like letting people unmute themselves. So we'll see how that goes with uh, this size group. But with that, we will just go ahead and get started. All right. So everybody can see my screen okay? Thumbs up? Okay, good stuff. All right, so today's presentation is on building IPHA's social media community of practice, or as I refer to it, the social media cop. Um, and if I could advance my slides, I guess that part of the presentation. So just a really quick to start off with, thank you so much to the Dental Dent Delta Dental Foundation of Iowa for, their, for financial support for this project. Um, we were able to get funded for them for the first year of this project, which really helped us um, give it a great push off. Secondly, who are Abigail and I? So my name is Ann Abbott, and I know some of you through various capacities. Um, I am a public health evaluator by training and by trade. I currently work for the University of Iowa School of Social Work. And so I know many of you know me through that capacity, both working with the state. Um, and then some of you might know me from my kind of side, I guess it's not a hustle because I'm not paid, I pay them, but I am also a PhD student in health communication in the Department of, Commun Department of Community and Behavioral Health at the University of Iowa. And I am joined by Abigail Chihak. Abigail, do you wanna introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, so I am Abigail Chihak. I am a public health social worker. And I currently work as the community health administrator at the Dallas County Health Department. And so Abigail has helped me on many projects over the years. Abigail is everything that is good and righteous and wonderful about a local public health fair. Always very happy to jump in and share her knowledge as well as her expertise. And we just love her for that. Um, and together, Abigail and I are the co-chairs. Um, we are both members of the social media community of practice. So I'm the current facilitator and Abigail has been taking on some of these things as well. And we are both the co-chairs of the IPHA communications committee, which are technically separate, but kind of merged in some ways. And so just a quick warning about what we're gonna talk about today. There is some flow to these slides, but not knowing who we are gonna get for this audience, we wanted to give kind of smattering a bunch of about a bunch of different topics related to the COP. And so obviously different people will get different things out of these slides, but in general today, we're gonna cover some basic trends in social media, why it's important, some things that maybe you already know, maybe some things you don't, as well as why social media is important in local public health and how social media in a local public health agency kind of works. And then lastly, we're gonna cover just kind of some inner workings of how the SM COP works and how you can connect uh, and relate to it. And so to begin with, you know, the COP was um, started around the issue, of, like around COVID in late 2019, 2020. Well, I guess not late 2019. It had been an idea that I had had for a long time. 
It did not come into fruition until COVID was already a region. Um, but where did this idea to start a community practice specifically for social media come, come from? And like I said, it was a brainchild of mine and Lena's and we really started this idea thinking through what are some of the things that a local public health practitioner really needs to focus on? And so these are the core competencies for public health professionals that come to us from the council and linkages. So you can really see in here, there's lots of communication, lots of outreach, lots of working with public stuff in here that applies to kind of why we'd focus on communication as a general issue to begin with. And then also looking at our Healthy People 2030 goals um, and seeing how many of the Healthy People goals relate to things that are health communication. So not necessarily all social media, but you know, social media is one way that we can achieve a lot of our communication goals. So I won't insult you by reading these to you, but just giving you the background for the project. And so social media is a giant part of health communication, but why did we focus on it here in Iowa? Well. Um, this is data from a company called Blue Compass, um, which is, I am not affiliated with it all, I'm not hawking anything, <laughs> um, but they do some market research specifically in Iowa. They're a marketing and communications firm, and they do a lot of different surveys. And one of the most recent surveys they did was looking at the percent of Iowans that were using different social media platforms. And as you can see here, a very large percentage of folks under the age of 40 or between the ages of 18 and 44 are using social media. Most of us are using Facebook. Um, and if you think about when Facebook came out, um, not shocking <laughs> where mo the most Facebook users are, but even things like Instagram, Snapchat, increasingly TikTok, again, this is over age 18. So if we look younger, I think this would shift quite a bit, but just huge social media usage, really saying that, you know, social media is important, an important way to communicate with almost everybody um, in the state. And if you were looking at that graph and thinking like, why didn't they look at over age 44? It was a very targeted survey. Um, and this data actually comes from the Pew Research Center, which does a much larger look at social media trends and social media usage, not just in Iowa, but across the United States. And as you can see here too, it's not, the social media is no longer just something for younger generations. Um, it is something everybody is using and it is an important uh, way of talking to different sorts of audiences about a range of topics, not just public health. And so when we think about what social media platforms are the most popular, I will caution you that this data is from uh, 2019, so it is starting to get a little bit old. We have seen some shifts, social media shifts a lot more quickly than traditional forms of media. But you know, you can really see here, um, we're looking at adults again and not necessarily teenagers. Facebook really does continue to be king. Um, and that is why a lot of the work we do with the community of practice, which we'll talk about a little later, is focused on Facebook as the main entity. So we call it Facebook first. Um, and But then also things like Instagram, YouTube, um, maybe not shocking to see those YouTube stats, but even Twitter and Snapchat, even you know, we think about things like TikTok and Snapchat as things for the young, right? Like if you have a high schooler at home, they're probably on TikTok all the time, right? But even older generations are using these. Um, and so again, just really showing how important social media is, not just to public health, but really to the fabric of our society. And so overall, social media is just such a huge part of the health communication space. It really feels silly to talk about health communication without mentioning social media these days. So just more data for you if it wasn't something you'd seen before. Again, all the data on this side is coming to us straight from the Pew Research Center, Center for American Life. If it's something you haven't explored before, the trends that they capture are really fascinating. You can definitely go down a rabbit hole on that site and I would encourage you to. It's a really interesting thing to look at. But again, like I was saying, it's an adult thing, it's a teenage thing, and increasingly, even a preteen, younger kids thing, social media is where people are and where we need to meet them. And so the problem and the reason we thought about having a community of practice specifically to focus on social media is because those of us in public health, um, particularly those of us who have some sort of public health degree or public health adjacent degree, something like that, do not necessarily get trained on how to do anything with digital media. So social media is a subset of digital media. Digital also includes things like email, uh, general website maintenance, as well as that. And if you've been in a public health program, I would be pretty shocked if you had more than one or two lectures 
<laughs> um, worth of uh, content on how to do any sort of outreach in a digital fashion or in a social or using social media. And so on top of that, um, the 2017 PH Wins survey, which was a survey of different public health departments by DeBoma, showed that even if you're not getting that content in a public health program, you're probably also not getting it in other programs as well, because only 14% of public health employees actually have a public health degree. And that is as of, as of 2017, so maybe it shifted a little bit, but still pretty low percent of the population with a public health degree. Additionally, if you are in a public health program, lots of those programs do not teach health communication as a specific focal area. Um, and even beyond that may not teach things like social media management, mass media, or other skills. And then conversely, you could be something like a public information officer, so a PIO, um, but you might not come from a public health background at all. You might have a degree in communications or journalism or business or marketing, something like that. And so really what we're seeing across the board is that there are just very few training options that really focus in on this cross section of public health communication and social media skills, which is why the COP was born. All right, from here, I'm gonna shift over to Abigail a little bit and have her talk about what it's like to be a local public health social media manager and PIO. Awesome, thank you, Anne. So there's also a couple of things we have to keep in mind um, as a government entity, right? That um, maybe private or just your personal account, you don't have to think about as much. So we always wanna think about accessibility. And if you receive any federal funding um, whatsoever, you really have to think about the section 508 rules. Um, so when that comes to social media, that includes including alt text, um, making sure that folks um, from all abilities can read your content. Um, a lot of the platforms have options that if you write your text in the text of it versus in the graphic, it'll translate it for you, which is super cool. Um, so that's one thing to think about. And the other thing is just the Freedom of Information Act and Iowa's open record laws. So this is something I always encourage people to talk with whoever your legal team is or your county attorney, because there's a lot of different interpretations on how social media really falls into this category. Um, but if you ever did get a, a FOIA request um, on your social media, thinking about how will you pull all those records out of your social media? Um, is there an archiving platform that your county's invested in to do that for you? Or is it something you're gonna have to do on your own? Um, and then another thing to think about is that if you don't have an archiving program, a lot of times anything that's deleted by the commenter or the other um, folks in the conversation, you don't have access to anymore. Um, and so you're not able to bring those records back. Next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so, oh, well, there we go. <laughs> so as um, we think about the future of like health communication and the changes that we're gonna see maybe in the public health services grant um, that a lot of our health departments receive is that shift towards population health, right? And social media is really a great opportunity to, um, in, to do population level health. Um, so these are just some of the categories. The grant, we don't have all the details yet because that comes out later this month, but if anyone is interested in learning how to really integrate more social media health communications practice into the services that you provide as a part of that grant, just let me know and I'd be happy to walk you through it. Next slide. Okay, so what does a day in the life look like when it comes to local public health social media? Um, and I'll just preface this by, you can put in as little effort or as much effort as you want into social health communications. Um, and it really varies from department to department. Um, so you could just utilize already to use plug and play messaging from a lot of partners that have social toolkits ready. Um, Iowa Cancer Consortium is a good example of this. They have toolkits that you can use and just plug in their messaging. Um, or you can spend more time to design your own content and messaging. Um, you could do one post a day. You could do multiple posts a day. Um, you could do it just once a week. It really, it's, there's a lot of variety and a lot of options there depending on your skill set and your time that you have available. Um, my strategy has kind of changed over the years, but this is kind of how I break it down these days. 
Um, so every year I put together kind of a basic plan on what I want to do that year. Um, this year, I'm really trying to focus on our specific programs at our department and specific things from our health improvement plan. Um, and then I also write an annual report every year to give to our board to kind of show um, what we've been able to do via social media and to really show them the value that that has on our health education and the reach that we're able to get there. Each month, I, I schedule all of my content all at once. Um, it takes a little bit of time, but then I don't have to go and do it every day or every week. I also pull metrics out of our social media um, so that way I can see if um, we're losing followers, if we're gaining followers, what, what um, content is really doing well um, and what maybe I need to change my strategies for in the future. I also, since I'm doing more department specific information this year, I do have to take the time to design those. Um, so that does take a little bit of time each month. And then every month I attend the social media community practice, which I would encourage you to do. Um, every week I then review the content that I have scheduled to make sure um, it's going to hit right. So if something, if there's a current event or something's happened that, so take the tornadoes um, that we had this last month, for example, I wouldn't necessarily want to post something about preparedness right after that happened, because it might come off um, poorly. Um, but so I might shift content around based on what current events are happening. And then every day I look over our notifications and review feed just to make sure we're responsive and engaging with our public. Next slide. So you might be thinking, how am I supposed to do this? I'm only one person. How do I do this on top of all my other duties? Um, well, you don't have to do it alone. There's a lot of um, people out there that will support you to help you build skills, to help you um, be inspired. So here's a couple of the ones I have. Uh, this community practice is really great for finding support in Iowa um, and especially with like uh, local response. So with COVID, it was really great because we were all working under a lot of the same um, guidance. And so we could bounce ideas off of each other. There's also a government social media community on Facebook that is helpful um, that spans the whole breadth of government too. So there's a lot of other folks from like law enforcement um, and city government. Uh, APHA actually has a list of all the health, a lot of health departments on Twitter. So you can see what other folks have been posting. Canva does a lot. Um, that's where I design most of my materials. Um, and they have little, they have a conference and they have little trainings that you can do, um, but they also have a Facebook group that you can um, see what other people have worked on. It's not public health focused, but it's kind of fun. Um, and then there's always trainings available. So the government social media conference is later this month um, and it is specific for government and you get to interact with folks from each platform to really troubleshoot anything um, and get ideas. And then there's also emergency management trainings um, specific to social media, which are helpful for, for example, the COVID response. And then APHA annual meeting, I will put a plug in there for that because they tend to have uh, short little workshops throughout the event specific to social media with other public health people, which is very helpful. Next slide. Okay, so this brings us to our first discussion question. So if you wanna take a moment in the chat, think about what have you noticed about your specific local public health social media during COVID-19? What have they been posting about? Um, and are people interacting with those posts? And we'll call on a couple of folks based on what you say in the chat to um, say more. Um, So Liz says that they live in Lynn County um, and feel like they've been posting resources and encouragement to get vaccinated. That's great. I've seen a lot of that as well. 
Gabby says up until two weeks ago, they were posting daily numbers for two years. Yeah. Uh, Adam says the community engaged more posts concerned about COVID numbers than count in the county rather than vaccination posts. I did see that a lot in Dallas County as well. Um, and just in general, people were much more responsive to COVID information than general public health information. Uh, we're posting clinic dates with general information. The brighter posts seem to do better. Absolutely. Post note testing and vaccination. We've seen our growth grow tremendously since the pandemic again. And I think that's a really great opportunity. We've seen that as well. Um, and we're hoping to keep a lot of those followers um, after we're done posting about the pandemic every day <laughs> to help them learn more about other public health initiatives. All right. I agree, the negative comments can be very disheartening. <laughs> but there's a lot of good ones out there too. So hopefully it balances it out. Now Debbie says they didn't have social media before COVID. Um, so they post weekly numbers, vaccination info and hope to keep the momentum going. That's awesome. Any other thoughts before we move on? All right, I'll send it back to you. Man. All right. Thanks, Abigail. Um, and so shout out to those couple counties that we had. I borrowed some of their social media content. I spend a lot of my time on this project. Um, looking at a different Iowa agencies, um, social media and deciding kind of what to put forward. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why I do that now as part of the COP. So uh, like I said earlier, the COP was created in 2020, uh, mostly in response to COVID. And that was um, how we were able to get some, a little bit of funding from the Delta Dental Foundation to begin with. And so when it was first created, it was open to Iowa's local public health agencies and specifically, um, we wanted to focus on those local agencies because we knew that, you know, based on what uh, folks were just saying in the chat, that a lot of the local agencies didn't necessarily have a social media person on staff. They didn't necessarily have a big social media presence before COVID, but then COVID strikes and all of a sudden, we need, we need a way to communicate with our community, right? We need a way to manage this. People are asking us questions all the time. Our phones are ringing off the hook we need more mass communication capacity. And so really focused in on those local public health agencies to begin with. But we are currently pondering an expansion to um, kind of a smaller group of select nonprofits and healthcare agencies. And just so folks know, we do have some healthcare agencies um, that house local public health agencies in Iowa. So we do have some folks already who are housed within healthcare, usually a local hospital system. Um, the initial focus was on creating more health promotion and education messages, specifically for Facebook. So like I said, just given what the stats we know about social media users in Iowa, most people use Facebook first. Um, and, you know, there are different social media we could be using to get the message out, but not all social media channels are equally good places to send people health messages. Um, and so we th we've really started on Facebook, we've continued on Facebook, though we do have a lot of agencies that are doing a great job on Instagram, they're doing a great job on things like TikTok, um, using less organic content, so less I have a page, let me post something on it and hope people share it, and more kind of an advertising approach, but that is definitely um, an area we've seen grow uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And so like I said, our initial focus was really on COVID prevention and mitigation, Later, we kind of, so we kind of started with the, the stay home messaging that we originally saw and then slowly moved into testing, vaccination, um, you know, and through the different waves. Um, some enterprising researcher is going to figure out what those distinct waves are at some point, but not now. Um, and so we have since, oh, excuse me, my dog is just tweeting on a oh, chewy bone behind me, which I don't know where she got. So I'll thank my partner for that later. 
Um, <laughs> but um, we have since expanded the COP messages into uh, non-COVID messaging since then. So we've been focusing a lot on mental health messaging, cancer prevention messaging across that spectrum, um, lots of other different types of messages. And so what is actually the COP? What does it do? How does it operate? Um, and so there are four main activity areas that we engage in as a community practice. And so the first of these are monthly virtual meetings that we use for sharing, networking. Sometimes we do some mini trainings. I saw the folks from the state um, Alzheimer's program, Katie and Greg are on, and we're happy to see them. Katie came to one of our meetings and presented about uh, Alzheimer's um, caregiving and risk prevention messaging with the Alzheimer's Association. So we're really happy to have her. Um, we also do what I call a weekly email roundup, which is kind of a lame name, but I haven't thought of a better one yet. So we're going to keep calling it the roundup until inspiration strikes my brain. Um, but in this email, it's kind of like an email of emails um, in which we take the 8 million emails that all have like maybe this much health communication or social media content in them from NATO, Public Health Communication Collaborative, the university, IPHA, Iowa Immunizes, uh, all of these, APHA, all of these different sources, and kind of try to cherry pick the ones that we think will be the most useful to folks who are in those social media manager, PIO, health educator roles. Um, so it's really meant to be a catered email specifically to the needs of local public health communicators. Um, in that email, we also include two to three pre-made social media posts. And so organizations, organizations, excuse me, like the Cancer Consortium, uh, or other places do what they call message sets, where they kind of send something out at the beginning of the month that has kind of pre-made, here's the graphic you can utilize and here's the wording you can utilize. Um, just given how quickly the situation was changing due to COVID, we weren't really comfortable setting something out right at the beginning of the month. And indeed, I'm glad we didn't do that because we would have been like, oh, yay, COVID is on the decline. And then the next week we would have had to rescind all those messages. So we have been doing it weekly, um, which has been great, but also draining. Um, and so that email has a lot in it. Um, the kind of related strategy that we also utilize with that email is we do operate on kind of an older listserv system, whereby the emails that we send out are open. We do not use an email marketing system because we actually want the members of the community of practice to talk to each other, not just talk to me or not just talk to Abigail. We want people to have somebody to lean on when they have a question or something comes out like, you know, something comes out from IDPH or something comes out from NATO that they don't understand. We want the, to build that trust and communication between the social media uh, managers and the PIOs within the Iowa network. And so we've actually had quite a bit of peer discussion and it really runs the gamut. Sometimes it's a really tiny issue. Sometimes it's a big issue. Um, so we do operate that, which is kind of goes against the grain of kind of good email marketing, but I think does build that connection. The last thing we do is we do operate some kind of longer form training opportunities. Um, we haven't done a big long training in a while, um, mostly because our funding ran out, but we'll talk more about ways people could help us with that or think about moving forward in that direction. And so the monthly meeting, we usually get about 10 to 20 folks per hour long meeting. Um, today we had a smaller meeting, I think because we had this meeting. We do have a couple of the COP members on here. I see Gabby DeWitt, number one public health cheerleader, um, talking about liking those emails. So Gabby's from Blackhawk. I saw Tiffany Peterson from Scott County is on here. Um, we just talked to Brittany from Pottawatomie County. Um, if I left you out and you're an active COP member, please feel free to put that in the chat, let people know who you are. Um, and you know, during COVID, it's no harm, no foul. If you can't dedicate time to coming to a meeting and talking to your peers, we get it. There was a lot going on. Um, we have bounced with those meetings monthly though about doing kind of mini trainings at the beginning of those. And then other times we just have kind of time to chat and connect with each other, figure out what's going on. Hey, what are you doing for messages? What am I doing for messages? Like, how could we collaborate? Um, like I said, we also do occasionally bring in outside speakers. So Iowa Immunizes, Elizabeth Faber has come in and talked. The Alzheimer's program has come in and talked. We're um, in talks right now with Quitline Iowa to come in and give a chat about what they're doing for messaging. Um, and so far we have not recorded those meetings. Um, so IPHA records a lot of their meetings for easier access. But we really wanted to have an atmosphere of kind of Vegas rules. So what happens in these meetings stays in these meetings. They don't need to be kind of all over the place. We don't want people to feel, feel really, you know, like they have to be really formal or like they can't say things that are actually on their mind um, just because something's being recorded. So we do not record those as of yet. 
Um, like I said, in that weekly email, we currently have about 50 email addresses that, that weekly email goes out to. Um, so about 39 agencies, some folks, there are some regional entities that receive that email too. Um, so Lynn Royer from Central Iowa is one of those folks. We have some others. Um, right now we're reaching about 45% of the local public health agencies. Um, we'd love that to be higher, but you know, we also understand not everybody has the ability to engage. Um, and the content for those emails really does vary. I generally try to include things like webinars, upcoming conferences, um, opportunities to partner with local groups. Um, but then I also include a lot of links. Um, so things like the Public Health Communications Collaborative, which is a project of the Beaumont and a couple of other organizations, some of those big national groups, so we can do it, the Vaccine Equity Initiative, if they're coming out with messaging that I think is really promising looking, I'll pitch that. I also like, I'm an evaluator by training. I really love data. If you've worked with me on an evaluation project, you've probably heard me preach about, well, what does the data say? Or, you know, why are we doing this? Like, what? for what reason do we have the strategy set up? And so I really like to include polling data um, the, from the Kaiser Family Foundation or any other place. The CDC has that vaccine um, hesitancy monitor that I like to include that as well. Also, if there are some fun articles, uh, you know, this is a little bit nerdy, but if there's fun articles from the Health Communication Science Digest or other things that I've seen come out, um, that kind of recent research, I will occasionally download something from a journal and slip in a PDF uh, don't don't tell on me. Um, I like to give people access to that. Um, it's a nice alternative to having a university account for everything. Um, and then, like I said, the emails also include those message sets. And so sometimes I'll include things like the Iowa Cancer Consortium. I love their message set. I've worked with them for a long time. I think their messaging is great. They cover the cancer control gamut. Um, and I'll also include things like, uh, you know, Project Recovery Iowa, if they have mental health messaging or Your Life Iowa, if there's other sources of stuff that I think, hey, here's good messaging that we can be putting out to the network, I will include it in those emails as well. And so, like I said, attached to each of those emails, there are also kind of like, I, proprietary is not the right word, but kind of catered messages specifically to Iowa local public health agencies. So. A lot of you have probably seen these if you're following your local public health agency. We also have some non-local public health agencies who like to go and grab these and reuse them, which is a danger of the internet. If you're one of those people, you should email me. We can talk more about you just getting them directly. Um, but here are just some examples. So Buchanan County, who's been a great partner, has posted a lot of this stuff. Um, Jasper County as well, Becky Pryor, um, a lot of folks just really, really happy to have these sorts of messages that are these kind of plug and play hey, this message is already made. It comes with a little blip for it. It's usually pretty accessible, easily translatable if they want to. And people really seem to like these messages and having them available to them. And so, like I said, we also run a listserv system that's really just about people helping people. Um, we don't have that many opportunities necessarily to connect with people that do the exact same thing we do all the time, even as IPHA. Yes, we all work in public health. Maybe we went to the same program or went to the same training, but to really connect with people that do are tasked with doing the exact same job you do in a slightly different place is kind of rare. So I, I think the listservs are really important piece of it. And I like listening to the conversations. I think folks always really have good informative stuff to share. And then we also do these longer trainings, which in general are open to COP members as well as the entire IPHA media um, sorry, um, membership group. Um, occasionally we do not, uh, we, we usually record them and make them accessible to everybody. And sometimes we charge for them. It depends a little bit how much, how expensive the trainer was essentially. Um, but these are usually one to two hours um, and then we'll record them, send them out after. And so uh, last fall we did uh, Becoming Better Messengers um, with the Network for Public Health Law. So we brought in that group to do a training on that kind of public health messaging. Um, which there will be a follow-up to that at this year's Public Health Conference of Iowa. Deborah Thompson and I are doing a follow-up kind of workshop. We also did a media engagement training for public health, and we also have some kind of mini trainings that are up on our YouTube page right now. And then we do have some additional kind of various and sundry things. Um, we do operate a Facebook page, so you can see here, IPHA Social Media Community of Practice, where we're just posting a lot of example sites. Um, so Sometimes it's other public health organizations. So today I posted something from Cerro Gordo County because they had a really cute quit line um, message using a dog and a shamrock hat that we all thought was adorable. And so I posted it so other people know about it and can use it. But I'll also post things from non-public health sources. So 
I'm located in Iowa City. I, I think I, University of Iowa, um, both Stead family and the larger hospital really do a nice job with their messaging around COVID. So I'll share that periodically. I'll share um, other hospital systems, other health centers. Sometimes I'll post IPHA stuff. It's really kind of various and sundry things. We do keep it as a public page. Um, so it doesn't have, um, it's not hard for people to access. It's not a closed group, but you know, there's not like a lot of commenting and stuff. It really is just kind of like a billboard of example posts. Um, also, we just have a general open door approach. So if you've met me, you know, I'm like the world's most extroverted extrovert. And so I have no problem giving people any of my contact information. You know, you see me walking down the street in Iowa City, stop me, say hello. And I kind of extend that open door approach to my IPHA email, my UIOA email. Um, people also kind of know they can, um, they know Lena, Lena occasionally pops on and answer questions for people as well. And I think that's been a really um, good part of the COP. Also, we do publish these kind of snippet how-to guides, um, which this um, image on the right is a really short training we did on how to use Canva um, with Rachel Schramm from the Iowa Cancer Consortium, who's also an IPHA board member. And then this year, we also let out mini grants and scholarships for the government social media conference that Abigail was referencing earlier. And so um, we're really excited about those mini grants going out. Um, we have some of the people on who received them this year. And then the scholarships to go to that conference, I think will also be really exciting. It is in a couple of weeks. So I'm hoping there's a lot of good shared knowledge that we can bring back with that. And so we did do a survey just at the end of last year around um, kind of what members of the community practice liked best. As you can guess, getting people to do a survey, I think I did this in the middle of the Delta surge when I didn't know what was it gonna be a Delta surge and I thought it was just a Delta blip. So we did not have an excellent response rate, uh, but for the most part, people mostly liked the social media sets. Um, they said that was their favorite part of the cop. This was a um, choose one question. You couldn't pick all that apply. And so now we're at discussion question number two. Um, and so anybody can answer this. You don't have to be a local public health person. You don't have to be a social media manager. Feel free to just uh, let it fly. What opportunities do you see for public health organizations? So both governmental and non-governmental. It could be your local public health agency. It could also be nonprofits. It could be the state. It could be APHA. What, or, what opportunities do you see for different organizations to make a bigger impact via social media? We're really curious about all of your ideas. So please put them in chat and then we'll call on some folks to explain a little bit more. So seeing a lot about language justice and language access, which, you know, I think the, the pandemic really called out how bad we were in a lot of those areas. Um, so great points to both Vivian and Arlene. Um, Ethan talking about correcting misinformation. <laughs> great point. Hard to do. Great point, though. <laughs> Sharon um, talking about social media assisting with completing the community health needs assessment for local public health. Great point from a former public health director, Sharon. Um, using different platforms. Yes, Vanessa, definitely. I think that is an area we have been thinking about at the kind of central cop level too of like, not just how we use different platforms, but how we use different features of existing platforms. So it's not necessarily always organic messaging on Facebook and just posting to a page. It's using ads, it's using stories, it's connecting um, some of our channels together, but also new platforms. Yeah. Gabby, do you want to talk a little bit about your WhatsApp work? You can unmute yourself. I can do that. I don't know that my camera is working. Um, one of our, one of my coworkers is our community health worker and she's a member of that community. And she very quickly told me that just putting things on our Facebook page in French was not going to work. So she has 
created and it took some doing as far as getting the the um, platform on her work phone but she has created a whatsapp group i believe she has about 80 community members that are on it and we are just very intentional in posting we at least a couple times a month um, some type of public health information any um, any big covid announcements the big one last month was the formula recall um, that was huge and actually was a, a, a misstep for us because we did not realize how important that was going to be to everyone and what we find is if they find the information somewhere else first they'll share it in this group and it's not always accurate information so always remembering that you know we have to get that out first because they'll they'll trust us if we get it out there but um, we need to be the first um, one that they see and not the fourth one that they see and so um, but it's been it's been really good and, and my coworker Julie is is does a really good job of um, telling us what what information we need to do. Um, almost everything we do is video or audio because um, her community, um, sh according to her, is not interested in doing a lot of reading of like long text or graphics. And so we do a lot of small videos and post them that way. Yeah, and that's just one example, I think, of uh, that nugget that Gabby just delivered of the types of things that we talk about on the COP meetings, um, because I think so many of our local public health departments are doing really good audience-driven public health outreach, organizing, and communication work, and it's great when we can know about it and people can share. So thanks for sharing, Gabby. All right, and from here, I'm going to hand it back to Abigail to talk about how even if you're not a social media person, even if you're not in a local public health agency, how can you still affect the COP and uh, benefit from some of the things that we're up to and make it reciprocal? Absolutely, and we invite all of you to join us in some way or another. Um, one of those um, opportunities is that if you are a PIO or a social media manager for a local public health agency, um, get on our list serve so that way you can get access to those weekly emails and all those resources that Ann sends out. Um, if you did a cool thing and you wanna share it, email it and we can share it out with other people to kind of spread the word. And then you can follow us on our Facebook page. There's lots of great tips and tricks there, um, as well as things that other folks have posted that have done well. Next. If you run a program that you want to build awareness around, let us know about it. Um, we'd love to sign you up to present at one of the monthly COP meetings or another training. Um, and if there's a specific post you want shared on our Facebook page, just email Ian at comms.iowapha.org. If you have a friend who does social media or is in marketing um, in some capacity, we'd love to learn from other sectors. Like Ann mentioned earlier, a lot of us don't come from a traditional communications background. So we're always looking uh, for folks that can help train us in those new skills. So anything in business, advertising, marketing, uh, nonprofit marketing, healthcare, or other uh, types of government agencies, we love to learn from you. Um, and you can support your local public health agencies. Um, you can like and follow, share our content. We love it when you do that because the more comments, the more likes that we get, the more it becomes vis visible to other people, um, thanks to the lovely algorithms out there. So um, engage with us. We love that. Um, it, especially for nonprofits, this is great because um, we don't always have a big budget for uh, marketing or anything like that. So being able to do that naturally is really wonderful. And if you feel like it, take it up the trolls. This is um, one of the things I always do. I leave kind of a space to breathe after a troll posts something because I think it's really powerful when people from our own community are able to kind of shoot them down with the information that we've provided them um, previously. And it really, it's really great. <laughs> Next slide. IPHA also has a great training library. So as Ann mentioned, there's some great YouTube videos out there, anything from um, intro to Canva to um, basic messaging tips to media training specifically for public health. Thanks, Lane. And that is the end. So 
if you have any questions, feel free to um, ask those. And if anything comes up along the way later on, here are our emails. You're more than welcome to reach out to us at any time. Um, we'll happily share what we know. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, so folks can either feel free to raise their hand or type something in the chat and we can call on you. Yes, Arlene, we can send out today's participation or participation, today's slides. <laughs> Uh, Brett, what's the turnaround time for, so we usually get it, Brett does a little bit of light editing on some of these videos, puts it up on the IPHA YouTube channel, which shout out, if you've missed any of the lunch and learns that are in the rest of the season, you can always go back and look at them. I recently just went back and looked at um, the Injury Prevention Research Center and Sabo's on the line because I had had to jump off early, so it's always great to be able to catch up. And then with those, we can send out the presentation slides uh, as well. Yep, yeah, I'll have the recording up. Uh um probably today or tomorrow and then i can pull the um the data from the zoom here and send that to you and so that you can send out the slides i can get that done right afterwards so you can get those out all right i'm just noticing how many of the cop members we have on here today so if you are a COP member and you would like to add anything to any of this, please, um, please do. I know you are not always the chattiest on big things, but we can lean on you today. So Susan Valletta from uh, Johnson County, Katie Reisner from Lynn County. Like I said, I saw Tiffany on here. Um, saw some folks from the Cancer Consortium, and like I said, we pretty shamelessly steal their stuff, have for a long time. Who am I missing on here? Debbie from Monona. Who else is on here? I'm sure there's plenty. Like I said, feel free to speak up. I can't. Cassidy from CG. Any other questions about how social media works or how the cop works? So I have a question for Abigail. How does Abigail determine what she wants to post every month? Sure, so I, um, like I mentioned, I have a kind of a game plan for the whole year. And in there is kind of a month by month breakdown. So each month I have one program from our department that I've picked out that I'm gonna highlight that month. I have one um, topic from our health improvement plan that I'm going to highlight that month. And so usually um, there's like two posts a week on both of those. And then there's a list of national health observances that are happening that month that I like to highlight, um, as well as a list of just general public health topics. Um, we were in the throes of COVID when I wrote my plan, so I had a plan to um, post about that three times a week. I've definitely changed that a little bit now. Um, and then I also uh, try to post about different partner programs that I know are coming up that month. So like Senior Farmers Market Program, I'll post about that more often in the summer. Um, LIHEAP, um, SIRHA, different, the pantry schedule, um, things like that. All right, or if there's any other last minute questions, go ahead, you can unmute, turn your camera on, whatever you want here in these last few minutes, or you can just throw it in the chat if that's what you prefer. So Arlene asked a question about what is considered social media, um, which is a great question because I think there's um, there's not always like a really strong bounds about like what counts as social media. And there's also not, there's no so grand social media council that says this is social versus this is not social. And so I like to think about all kinds of forms of technology and platforms about they are just tools that can be used in different ways. And so, like I said, 
Zoom, I think a lot of folks that were focused on video content specifically earlier in the pandemic. So I know uh, Guthrie County does this a lot where they do kind of like a, 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 it's not called dinner with the director, but like a just kind of uh, visual podcast and they use, the, they use their Zoom technology for it. I think it's something the university hospital utilizes as well, where it's just a way to use Zoom that isn't a video conference and then they're posting it on their social media. Um, so I wouldn't consider Zoom social media, but I would also say like, it doesn't matter. Like if you can figure out a way to use it on social, it's social. <laughs> All right, any other last minute questions? If not, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up a few minutes early, let Ann go check on what her dog's barking at and have a few minutes of her day back. So I thank you, Abigail, thank you, Ann, for coming and sharing with us today. Uh, and thanks all of you who came here and shared your lunchtime with us today. We hope you can join us next month again. I think it'll be on the 21st. Uh, we'll be joined by JC Miller, who's going to talk with us about oral health and the Oral Health Iowa Coalition. We're always looking for potential topics for future lunch and learns. We're scheduled through this spring, um, but we have some openings in the next fall season. So if you have any ideas, we welcome those to share your work or the work of your peers. Um, just a reminder, as a nonprofit organization, IPHA relies on membership dues and sustaining donors to support a mission. Uh, if you are already a member, we, we thank you. If you're not yet, please consider joining IPHA. If we have any students here, um, you can check with your department chair. Some programs have funds to support your membership. Um, if you are a member, again, we thank you. And we appreciate any donation that fits within your budget. You can join and give at IOPHA. Dot org. So the recording of this Lunch and Learn and all previous Lunch and Learns um, will be on the Iowa Public Health Association YouTube channel, as well as any other webinars that you may have missed or like to revisit. But with that, um, I think we can call it a day. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you next month. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Abigail. See ya.